Welcome to our live webcast, PLCs with Cybersecurity and Asset Management System Integration, Improved Plant Uptime and Safety, co-hosted by ISA and Honeywell. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mike. I'll be the operator for our presentation today. Now, before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. On the right-hand side of your screen, you see the Q&A window. There's a large window which holds all of your sent messages and a smaller text box at the bottom where you will type in your questions. To send a question, click in the text box and type your text. And when you're finished, click the Send button. All questions that you submit are only seen by our presenters, and uh, your questions will be responded to at the end of our presentation today. At the conclusion of today's program, we also ask that you complete a brief post-event survey. If you would, please take a moment to complete this survey, as it will help ISA plan future web events. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Swapnil Edkar is a Global Product Marketing Manager for Honeywell's Control Edge PLC and Control Edge RTU. He holds International Beta Gamma Sigma Honors and is Six Sigma Green Belt Certified. Swapnil has over 13 years of multifunctional experience in the automation industry. At Honeywell, he has held various roles in engineering, sales, and marketing with focus on oil and gas and chemicals. Swapnil earned an MBA from IE Business School in Spain and has a Bachelor's of Engineering in Instrumentation. So at this time, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Swapnil to begin. So Swapnil, welcome. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to today's session on PLCs with cybersecurity and with asset management system integration, improve plant uptime and safety. So I would like to start uh, here with some logos for the government agencies who are focusing on cybersecurity. So as you can see on the screen over here, there are several uh, countries uh, who have appointed government agencies focusing on cybersecurity. Starting uh, from left, you have United States, uh, UK, Germany, New Zealand, Australia, Qatar. Most of them, as you see on screen, are now starting to have a cybersecurity emergency response team. And what does it mean? And why are they setting up a special agency for cybersecurity? It basically indicates that governments are signaling to businesses the importance of cybersecurity. And why is it important and why are they doing it now? And the reason behind uh, this is cybersecurity risk and attacks is occurring every day at industrial control systems resulting in loss to companies ranging from thousands of dollars to millions of dollars depending on size of the company and nature of the business. Now, it's important to spread the awareness of cybersecurity risk and impact of incident at industrial control system, especially non-critical industrial sites this needs guidance to frame their cybersecurity policies and structures. Government agencies are driving cybersecurity compliance at critical as well as non-critical industrial sites one key part of their push includes requirement report incidences to make sure any future risks can be averted by developing appropriate measures. Now, some reported statistics by market research company Business Advantage suggest that 50% of industrial control systems experience some kind of cyber incidents in an year, and 20% of those companies faced cyber incidents twice a year. It's a significant number um, that we're talking about here. More than 50% of incidences are caused by malware and 25% of incidents are caused by ransomware. Now, these two types of incidents contribute to around 70 to 75% of cyber incidences. There is a difference in the attitude of critical and non-critical infrastructure companies towards cybersecurity. For example, if you look at companies in oil and gas, refining, and any other critical infrastructure locations like nuclear facilities, they're more aware and they're more precaution, they take more precautions on the cybersecurity aspects, whereas a lot of non-critical industries and uh, facilities, they're not so serious about the cybersecurity. These governments, through the signaling and setting up these agencies are basically making sure that the policies and processes are put together by not only critical but also by non-critical industries. 
Now, it's also essential that these industry organizations identify risk and deploy processes, policies, and behavior to overcome these risks and minimize impact of cyber threats to their organization. I would like to walk you through a couple of examples, and one of the examples I'm going to talk about now, uh, you would have heard about it in every cybersecurity related presentation, but I would like to do it again. Probably it may have some new aspects that you would uh, learn. So Stuxnet, malicious computer worm, had shaken the industrial automation world when it happened in 2010. So the PLC installation saw first major cyber incident when Stuxnet virus hit the Siemens PLCs at critical nuclear infrastructure in Iran. It was eye-opener for industrial control system vendors and companies buying control systems. Now, incidents like Stuxnet led to development and adoption of cyber security standards and policies by government and companies. So Stuxnet not just hit the nuclear facility in Iran, but it also targeted and infected around 200,000 plus computers and caused 1,000 caused machines to physically degrade. Just to um, go a little bit more into what this virus did. So the target of this particular virus was PLC and SCADA systems at nuclear power plants and the programs were nuclear programs, uh, nuclear programs. And the target location was Iran. Now, what really happened here? So the reported impact uh, of this particular cyber incidents was compromised Iran, Iranian PLCs in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the power plant. Also collecting information on industrial systems, it caused fast spinning centrifuges to tear themselves apart. It's a major safety hazard. Uh, as you can imagine, spinning, fast spinning centrifuges Fugitives steering apart may cause a lot of harm, not just to the plant, but also personnel working in the plant. One fifth of the Iran nuclear centrifuges were ruined. Okay, and how was this transmitted? So this was introduced through a USB flash drive, and it affected this worm that propagated across the network, scanning for Siemens Step 7 software on computers, uh, controlling a PLC. Now, in the absence of either criteria, that is having a step seven software and, con and software controlling PLC, Stuxnet virus became dormant inside the computer. If both the conditions were fulfilled, Stuxnet introduced the infection rootkit into PLC and step seven software. Now, the mo it modified the code on the PLC and it also gave a false feedback to the, to the operators by returning a loop of normal operation system values feedback to the user. So it basically masked the um, infection that it was causing on the PLCs and impact it was causing to the process. Now Stuxnet required specific slave uh, variable frequency drives to be attached to the target Siemens S7 PLCs and its associated modules. It only attacked those PLCs with variable frequency drives from two specific uh, vendors that is Wacon based in Finland and Ferraro Paya based in Iran. Furthermore, it monitors the frequency of attached motors and only attack systems that spin between 807 hertz and 1210 hertz. Now, the industrial applications of motors with these parameters are pretty diverse and may include pumps or gas centrifuges. So, as you can see from this incident, particular incident, the kind of damage a virus can have on the PLC installations. So second example that I'm going to talk about here is a WannaCry ransomware cyber attack. As you can see on the screen here, it's a screen capture of the infected computer. Uh, it's pretty descriptive. It tells what happened to my computer. It tells user how they can recover their files. And, uh, and this virus works in a way such that if users pay through Bitcoin, their files were basically made available back to the users. Until then, the files were encrypted. Now, it also, as you can see from the screenshot here, it also let the users know that the payment, when it has to be done, how much time they have left for it, and when they will lose the files. So pretty uh, informative page that was provided by this ransomware cyber attack. Now, it infected more than 230,000 computers globally, 
it was a global attack and it impacted 150 plus uh, countries now some of the key organizations which were infected were uh, nhs systems in uh, uk uh, telefonica uh, company fedex petrobras honda nissan car manufacturers so these are some of the examples of the companies that were in, affected now a little bit more about this uh, ransomware attack so one of the ransomware attack was uh, it, it took place in May 2017 worldwide cyber attack uh, by WannaCry, WannaCry ransomware CryptoWorm. And it targeted the computers running Microsoft operating system by encrypting the data and demanding ransom payment in the Bitcoin cryptocurrency. Now, how did the payload work? It worked in the same fashion as modern ransomware. It finds and encrypts the range of data files then displays a ransom note informing the users and demands payment to Bitcoin, as you can see on the screen here. Now, uh, to give an example of how it impacted some of the organizations. So the attack affected many national health services hospitals in England and Scotland, and up to 70,000 devices, including computers, MRI scanners, blood storage refrigerators, and theater equipments uh, may have been infected uh, as per the reports. And there are also reports that Nissan Motors in England stopped production after ransomware affected some of their systems. Renault also stopped production at several sites to stop spread of the ransomware. Now, um, this, is, this particular uh, ransomware attack did not affect the control system. However, it is an example of how a cyber attack can cause loss of production and also can cause economic loss is, is, a, is a classic example of that. To summarize, how do these uh, cyber incidences impact business? We just saw a couple of examples here. And as you can see, cyber threats on PS systems has unim unimaginably high impact on businesses. We just saw an example on Stuxnet virus had caused plant and safety uh, uh, issue for the personnel working at the site. Safety should be the top reason to ensure right selection of PA systems with built-in cyber security. And as, it, as you can see from the slide, it impacts personnel as well as plants. Now, also, any cyber incident involves significant economic loss driven by safety hazard in case of any accident. By need to compulsory reporting and by uh, compulsory reporting of cyber incidences and necessary follow-up action to mitigate future threats. Uh, it also causes economic loss is, and it causes loss of corporate reputation who uh, has failed to ensure right cyber security measures. Now, failure to comply can lead to compromise of confidential customer information or any confidential company data, which eventually would cause a loss of reputation for a company. Moreover, cyber security insurance companies demand higher premium from sites that are non-compliant to cyber security standards. Now, non-compliance can lead to a fine as good as $100,000. And if there is any accident or any incident at the site which causes the plant downtime, it can cause um, a loss of millions of dollars depending on the industry. For example, oil and gas and refinery have pretty high cost of downtimes. Now, with introduction of cybersecurity regulation by most government agencies that we saw, it is now responsibility of companies to ensure hiring, training, and building organization-wide awareness of cybersecurity standards and regulations. The need for compliance is driving change in processes and policies of the companies. Some examples of uh, the changes in the process, uh, it, it can be processed to design and operate the plant. It gets changed by introduction of the new regulation. And it also could be changed in the control system selection uh, method. So the purchase department would look for control systems which are compliant to IEC 62443 kind of uh, security uh, standards. Now, um, the question is, are organizations fully prepared to deal with attacks? Now, there is still an opportunity for organizations to learn about industrial cybersecurity standards and benefit of adopt, adopting products compliant to those standards. I'm going to uh, just walk through and uh, read this slide over here because it is pretty much uh, self-explanatory, but I would like to 
talk a little bit about what are these IAC 99 and IEC 62443 standards. So basically, as I said, these are standards um, or, or series of standards, technical reports and related information that defines procedures for implementing electronically secure industrial automation and control systems. This guidance applies to end users, system integrators, uh, security practitioners, and control system manufacturers responsible for manufacturing. So this standard is specifically designed for industrial automation needs. Okay. Now, how is it being driven? So it is being driven through a organization called ISCI, which is Indus ISA Security Compliance Institute. It's a subsidiary of ISA, and it develops industrial automation control system certification, which assesses the conformance against ISA 62443 standards. Now, uh, this institute is committed to maintain alignment with ISA secure certification requirements to the ISA 62443 series of standards. Uh, what is ISA secure? Now, ISA secure is a program which is run by ISCI, and it is developed by the Consortium of Industries, and their goal is to accelerate the industry-wide improvement of cybersecurity for industrial automation and controls. So ISA Secure uh, designation is earned by the control systems or the suppliers for the product that demonstrate adherence to the IS ISCI cybersecurity specification derived from open consensus industry standards. So that was just introduction because we are going to get a little bit more in details of these standards, what they mean, uh, how the certification, ISA Secure certification can be achieved by the companies and why it is important to select the PLCs that are ISA Secure compliant. So all these questions uh, will be answered, but these terminology is very important to understand before we go further into detail. Now, ISA 6244C, as I mentioned, is a standard and they came up with a framework that you can see on the screen right now. So this particular framework has been divided into four different sections, which is general policies and procedures, systems, and components. Now, if you start from the top, which is general, the top category, it includes common or foundational information such as concepts, models, and terminologies. Also includes uh, product that describes security metrics, and security life cycles for IACS. So IACS stands here for Industrial Automation Control System Solution Suppliers. Okay. Now, this is mostly defining the terminology is concepts and models. Second, that is policies and procedures. Uh, this particular category, uh, it targets the asset owners. Uh, these address various aspects of creating and maintaining an effective IACS security program. The third category, which is systems, so this particular category is applicable for a system level of certification, not just for the product. So this category includes work products that describe system, in, system design, guidance, and requirement for secure integration of control systems, which is integrated control systems. Core of this is uh, zone and conduit design models, um, because when you integrate systems, it will create zones and conduits, and the design model for those needs to be defined. Now the fourth category, it specifically targets the product. Now when we say product, it is, it is embedded devices. It focuses on the embedded devices like PLC. Now it includes work products that de describe the specific product development and technical requirements of control system products. This is primarily intended for control product vendors. Um, that is the manufacturers of PLC, the DCS, CADA systems but can be used by integrators and asset owners to assist in procurement of security product. Again, this particular component level is broken down into two further things. So we'll be focusing pretty much in this session on the component level of uh, the framework because that is what is applicable for devices like PLC. Um, and, and the first part of it, that is ISA 62443-4-1, it talks about product development requirements. That is also sometimes termed as software development life cycle uh, assessment. Now, this particular assessment, it focuses on how well your product requirements for security or functionality are defined. Are you adopting the right practices and processes described throughout the product development cycle? That's what is the focus of the first part of this certification uh, of the standard. 
uh, under the component and the second part of um, the component that is IISA 62443-4-2 it focuses on um, the detailed technical requirements for um, IACS components level now it also focuses on embedded devices security assessment standard um, which we will be looking into in the upcoming slides so there are four levels of security defined by IEC 62443 and the compliance to each level for a product like PLC means something and the adherence to each of the level it if it increases in level it means that increased level of security assurance as you go up the ladder now the first level that is level one of protection is against casual or coincidental violations um, that means it can be because a pen drive inserted into uh, let's say computer and transmitting the wires and it provides basic protection is the level one level two protection is against intentional violations using simple means um, here it may mean that somebody has intentionally put a program or malware or virus onto a pen drive and it is trying to infect a particular embedded device or a, PL or a PC or at a site. The third level that is further uh, complicated which is protection against intentional violation using sophisticated means. Here um, the hacker or the attacker could be using sophisticated means to enter into your system either to um, impact the functionality of the process or to get and extract some confidential information out of the system and level 4 attack is protection against intentional violation using sophisticated means with extended resources so it is a pretty uh, high level of uh, protection and when the extended resources are provided it is typically through some state sponsored mechanism so it's the highest level of protection that any device can offer now uh, all the certifications that are granted under IIT secure program uh, they contain three elements that you can see on screen here so the first element is the software development security assessment the second is functional security assessment and third one is communication robustness uh, testing so as you can see uh, for the first two assessments that is software development security assessment and functional assessment the level of uh, tests and complexity of uh, the adherence is, it increases whereas for the communications robustness test it is uh, the same for all the levels now going through each of them so the software development security assessment and functional security assessment increases in rigor for level 2 and level 3 uh, while the communication robustness criteria are same uh, for all the levels of IS secure EDS certification device undergoes the software development security assessment and functional security assessment and communication robustness testing. Now, SBSA uh, exam examines that is software development security assessment exam is the process under which the device was developed. It pretty much focuses on how well the requirements are documented uh, for uh, for the development cycle phase, such as security requirement specification. It could be security software architecture design, security risk assessment, or and threat modeling. It could also be how well you have defined the detailed software design, software model implementation and verification, uh, security validation testing. So all the different stages of um, the product life cycle, it is a requirement that it has to be pretty much well recorded. Now functional security assessment, it goes into different areas of uh, assessment which are explained at the bottom of the slide. So it examines the security capability of the device and which recognizes that in some cases security functionality may be allotted to other components of the device overall system environment. Now FSA that is functional security assessment it examines the device from the point of view of required security capability and correct implementation. So it focuses pretty much on how well um, the implementation has taken place after the requirements uh, and the design was documented. Now, the third part is, uh, so if you uh, going a little bit into details of uh, functional security assessment, um, there are seven different assessments within 
the functional security assessment that is access control, use control, data integrity, data confidentiality, uh, restrict data flow, and uh, timely response to events. So all these um, evaluations are basically indicating that when a device is evaluated against the standards, it, it goes through a rigorous assessment. And a device which goes through this rigorous assessment and fulfills the requirement, um, it provides the best cybersecurity capabilities um, is ensured through this assessment. Now going a little bit into the details of CRT, that is Communication Robustness Test, it basically examines the capability of the device uh, to adequately maintain essential services um, while being subjected to normal and um, malformed network protocol traffic at normal or extreme high trust rates. Now, uh, the susceptibility of known attacks against each protocol will be tested as a part of this certification. Uh, inappropriate message response or failure to failure of device to continue to adequately maintain essential services demonstrate potential security vulnerabilities within the device. Now, uh, the key definition of IS secure um, communication robustness test is adequately maintain essential services. So it basically ensures that essential services are always maintained. Uh, for example, the process control, safety loops, or process view, um, or commands such as uh, changes in the set point, changes in the parameter of the process control, and the process alarms. These are essential services that are always maintained throughout the operations. To pass this particular test, ISA Secure Communication Robustness Test, the process control safety uh, loop must be maintained under all network traffic conditions. It's a, a minimum requirement to go through this test. Okay. So going to the next um, slide over here, uh, which talks about a little bit more details on what are the different uh, security aspects that needs to be considered for PLC security, not just the functionality aspect or just having the um, uh, things like software, um, uh, things like uh, software development, security assessment, uh, over and above if there are certain things that need to be focused on trusted supply chain, making sure that the components that are getting used into the PLC are coming from the uh, trusted suppliers. Uh, the hardware which is coming from the suppliers are basically uh, having some kind of unique identification which allows um, identification of the correct hardware being used. Any, um, any counterfeit hardware should be detected. Uh, once the system starts up. Um, so the, this basically ensures that the trusted hardware is being fit into the device, which is genuine device is being supplied to the customers. Uh, secure boot is another method where the signed firmware is loaded onto the, um, onto the CPU. We will go further into the details of secure boot, what it does and how it helps. Basically, it helps to ensure that only authorized firmware are getting loaded onto the hardware. Uh, now the trusted OS, uh, that is making sure that the OS is hardened, signed operating systems are loaded onto the um, onto the PLCs. Uh, secure communication methods like uh, IPsec are supported on PLCs for any communications with the Windows-based um, uh, Windows-based nodes connecting to the PLC, and other services like PKI or secure software download. All these are also taken care of uh, during um, during design of the product. So uh, there are a lot of announcements that are coming up in the PLC products these days, and they ensure uh, these kind of uh, security measures are being implemented into the PLC. Now, all these measures basically ensure that the plant uptime is ensured, uh, the plant safety is ensured, and uh, it is also complying to the standards laid out by the government agencies. So how does the whole process of certification work? How, how does a PLC vendor get IAC secure certification? So this is a simplified version of um, how the whole process works. So we went through the IEC 62443 standard. Uh, then there is a security standards committee, which is ISA 99. Uh, they create the standard. Then uh, the certification agency comes together to evaluate any submissions from PLC vendor to check the compliance against the standard. If the PLC vendor system is compliant, 
to the standards, they provide the certification, which is called as IHA Secure Certification. So uh, here the uh, certifying agency example could be Exida or it could be something else. Now this certification is called IAC Secure Embedded Device Security Assur Assurance Certification um, or EDSA certification, IAC Secure EDSA certification. Uh, an embedded device is special purpose device running embedded software designed to uh, directly monitor, control, or um, actuate an industrial process. A PLC is a good example of an embedded device. So the PLC is going um, through this assessment uh, will provide, uh, will, will get the IAC secure certification if they are complying to uh, 62443 uh, standards. Now, an embedded device that meets the requirement of IAC secure you know, specifications uh, receives the certification. This certification uh, is particularly a recognition of a product uh, security characteristics and capabilities and provides an independent industry stamp. Uh, of approval similar to safety integrity level, uh, which is typically done by uh, certification agencies like uh, TUV. Okay. And uh, in that case, the standard that it is assessed against is uh, IEC 61508 for an example. So it's as good as uh, those standards for uh, safety certification, uh, yeah, SIL, SIL uh, certifications. Uh, we'll walk through uh, some of the examples of uh, the measures implemented in the PLC. Now, uh, nowadays PLCs come with embedded firewall in the CPM itself. So this is an example uh, of a PLC where, for example, you have a, a firewall embedded in CPM itself without a need for any external firewall. And typical uh, firewall functionalities like port filtering, rate limiting, flow control or deep packet inspections uh, is possible through um, yeah, through the embedded firewall within the PLC. Going through each of them, how does it work and what benefits it offers. So port filtering um, is basically a firewall rules on PLC that can be used to block or allow uh, traffic through an interface based on port number. Uh, the source and destination IP address, the direction that is incoming or outgoing, um, um, uh, data packets and the protocol, this can be used to block traffic based on the policy. So all these policies can be defined within the uh, PLC CPM firewall. The rate limiting functionality basically uh, is a configuration on PLC which restricts the amount of uh, various outbound traffic. The outbound traffic here is important as, uh, for example, I can mention here, if you uh, were a reflector in a smurf attack, Rate limiting could be used as a temporary solution to limit the flood of traffic that you are sending to victim network. Um, and it's not just protecting your device, but making sure when you are connecting or connected on a network, you are having measures to protect other devices on the network. Uh, some of the advanced capabilities like flow control. Uh, now the uh, flow control basically is a firewall filter on the PLC, which allows you to control flow of data packets and uh, the local packets. The flow control mechanism uh, basically delivers the quality of service. So quality of service, for, in, for an example, can be limit the number of network bandwidth on one user, uh, so how much bandwidth one user can take up, or limit how much of the network capacity can be used for specific service uh, on the network. Um, it's, it's another method of restricting uh, the number of um, uh, the number of messages on, on the network uh, where the PLC is connected. Now, for the le uh, level of uh, the, um, for the higher level of measures uh, can be deep packet inspection. So deep packet inspection basically examines the content of the packet uh, which is passing through a given checkpoint on the PLC and it makes uh, uh, some good real-time decisions based on rule assigned. Now, you also have uh, some systems like intrusion detection systems uh, which are capable of detecting the intrusions, but uh, they have very li limited capability on blocking such attacks. However, the deep packet inspections are used to prevent attacks from viruses and worms uh, at a wire speed. Um, now, the deep packet inspection can be effective against um, buffer overflow attacks or denial of service kind of attacks. Sophisticated instruction, uh, sophisticated in intrusions, uh, and small 
percentage of worms that can fit into a single package can also be protected using deep packet inspections. Now, all PLC nodes basically should include an embedded control firewall on their uplink um, as well as on their downlink interfaces. Now, port filtering and rate limiting should be the primary features uh, that will be supported by PLC and advanced features, as I said, like deep packet inspection of low control um, should be available for conduit nodes, uh, for example, a network gateway to prevent traffic flow across network zones. Now, embedded firewall functionality, both on uplink and downlink uh, ports of the PLC node, uh, are good to segregate networks and it significantly improves PLC node defense to deny of service kind of attack. So, I think um, it's a pretty uh, great feature uh, which gets uh, embedded onto the PLC. Now, some examples I have uh, mentioned here on the slide, which talks about um, what kind of uh, benefits it offers. Now, it, uh, a PLC with embedded control firewall can limit the rate of connections to mitigate any sync flood attacks. Uh, it can prioritize internal packets on downlink port, which is to the IO modules, over the external packets, so which restricts any uh, kind of cyber uh, threats that are posed uh, when the downlink communication uh, is, is taking place. So uh, that, that these are some of the examples. Another example I would like to mention here is how it limits uh, or it allows NTP um, and let's say time sync data packets but it limits the rate uh, at which these packets are sent. So uh, all these functions that I mentioned above, that is port limiting, rate limiting, flow control, deep packet inspections, uh, all those put together, there are different applications in uh, the way um, the real uh, data that flows through the PS network can be controlled. So uh, that's about the embedded control firewall. So the next uh, feature which you will see in the modern PLCs is uh, the secure boot capability. So what does the secure boot capability mean? So it is basically ensuring that any unsigned software uh, and firmware does not get copied onto the PLC. Um, only the signed software and firmware gets copied onto the PLC uh, through hardware root of trust. So what does it mean? So whenever a firmware or software is getting copied onto the PLC, uh, the data packet is validated with some um, uh, keys that are generated through the certificate on the firmware and uh, the keys that are compared against the uh, associated hardware uh, on the uh, on the controller. So the hardware basically uh, decodes the certification bits and ensures that the software or firmware which is getting copied onto the PLC are genuine firmware and software from the PLC vendor itself and not any malicious software. So that's um, an example of how it prevents any malicious software to be copied onto the PLC. Uh, it addresses the threat uh, breaching the firewall and the, uh, the threats that are reaching the core. Um, it also uh, employs the hardware and software architecture that ensures survival of operating systems. In case of any uh, attacks on the operating systems, uh, the self-reboot with clean copy of operating system uh, upon verification failure is possible and the bit streams are qualified prior to load on the execution. So uh, this feature basically ensures that you don't allow copying of any malicious software onto the PLC and any threat at the boot, boot stage of uh, the PLC. Now the third uh, feature that you will uh, see on modern PLCs is the secure communications capability. Now, um, it can be achieved through different means and IPsec is one of the uh, very robust means of achieving it. it. IPsec creates a tunnel between a PLC and connected nodes. Uh, for example, PLC typically connects to a workstation, engineering workstation, or, or DCS or a SCADA system through Modbus. Uh, it can connect to a panel PC, uh, let's say through OPC UA or Modbus. It can connect to the asset manager using hot IP. So IPsec provides secure communications for multiple protocols and any Windows connected device, Windows operating system um, device that connects to the PLC. Now what it does is, is prevent, it prevents the man in the middle kind of attacks and protects PLC from unauthorized access using NSA should be recommended algorithms. 
it, the PLCs have capabilities to lock down the communication um, and explicitly the communication needs to be enabled for each node that should be allowed to communicate with the PLC. The third mode um, that is supported is the encryption. Uh, so there are basically three modes that are supported, encryption, authentication, and clear text. So encryption ensures uh, that integrity and confidentiality of data uh, in the root. Uh, authentication ensures um, integration of data, uh, integrity of the data and root. And clear text is a special interoperability only situations where you enable um, the specific node which should talk to the PLC. Okay. Now, having gone through uh, these, um, the standards, uh, the threats, the kind of um, impact it is causing business, and how modern PLCs are dealing with those threats and aligning with the standards laid out by ISA and IEC, that is 62443. So different threats and how the PLC measures are protecting uh, the control system. Now, the first example is the threat of um, unauthorized modification on data in transit. Now, certification-based solution to authenticate, peer, and encrypt the data in transit uh, prevents from such attacks. Uh, that's the takeaway. Uh, then, prevent WannaCry kind of ransomware, uh, ransomware attempt. The hardware root of trust-based secure boot solution can um, tackle these kind of attacks. Uh, prevent loss of essential functions during network storm. Um, Built-in firewall to protect and maintain essential services during storm situations are uh, helpful to uh, deal with the um, network storms and denial of service kind of attacks. And prevent load of unauthorized configuration. It can be done through two means. Um, one is through the hard switch on the PLC itself, which prevents loading of the unauthorized software. And secondly, uh, the certificate or signed firmware uh, getting copied onto the PLC, so it can be uh, done through multiple means. So all in all, the, uh, the modern PLCs, which are compliant to IEC 62443 standard, which are IEC secure certified, provides better compliance, reduced cost, and uh, it improves the plant availability. Um, is, is the overall uh, takeaway from the cybersecurity section of today's webinar. Moving on to the hard integration, so uh, it's another important uh, part of uh, the PLC. So hard integration on the PLC is pretty critical when it comes to integration to, with the smart devices like transmitters and valves, uh, integration with the asset management system. Um, so, uh, so nowadays you'll find that the hard IP protocol, which is hard over IP, uh, it is not a serial connection. It is a direct connection to a network switch um, using a Ethernet cable, so it provides you a Ethernet connection um, of the PLC to the asset management system. Uh, it also allows direct connectivity to the DCS and CADA system if they support hard IP protocol. Now, due to this, the crucial diagnostics and process information will be fed to the application seamlessly, uh, painlessly, and quickly without additional or special connections. Now, PLCs with hard pass-through I.O. modules can enable this. So there are PLCs um, in the market which provide um, readily available hard pass-through modules, which eliminates any need for any hard stripper in between PLC and the smart devices. We will see more benefits due to this kind of a structure and the architecture when it comes to making sure that the quality diagnostic information flows into the asset management system or it allows any preventive maintenance. Now, as I said, hard IP is the open standard. Uh, it communicates over Ethernet. Um, and biggest benefit is it offers design flexibility. So when I say it offers design flexibility, it allows integration with any asset management system uh, which supports hard IP protocol. Uh, it delivers asset information directly to the SCADA and DCS system if there is no asset management system and DCS SCADA system supports hard IP protocol, you don't need uh, an additional asset management system. Uh, remote access of device um, or device management uh, is possible using the hard man, hard, uh, asset management systems. Another benefit and flexibility that is offered by hard IP is it prevents uh, the investments and it protects the investment using any existing 
a plant network infrastructure. For example, uh, if a asset management system is installed at a site uh, and it supports hard IP, a PLC supporting hard IP can connect to the same asset management system without a need for any additional asset management node to be installed. And the modern asset management systems uh, support multiple protocols, not just hard, but also Profibus, IS-800, wireless uh, protocols, and uh, DE protocol. And it also supports different uh, libraries like EDDL, D, uh, DFT, DTM, and FDS standards on the same node. Um, so all in all, with hard IP supported PLCs, it uh, simplifies the integration and allows easy flow of information between smart transmitters to the asset management system, resulting into the timely maintenance and improved client availability. Going further down, so we uh, were focusing on how the hard information will be available on the asset management systems, but it's also crucial to have this hard information all on the PLC, uh, not just on the asset management system. So this basically adds to further benefits, um, that is use of hard commands or hard function blocks to get the information directly, the, that is the hard protocol or hard information directly into the PLC programs and use them for functions which are important for commissioning, installation, and plant operations. Uh, some examples here um, for cost saving during the commissioning installation. Hard command support on the PLC program uh, ensures that multivariable transmitters can be connected to the PLC. It reduces the number of transmitters because they transmit multiple variables through a single transmitter. It reduces the cost of transmitters. It reduces the cost of wiring, cabling, trenches, um, cable phase, and all the cost associated uh, with additional device. Uh, moreover, it also saves efforts on loop tests, calibration. So all these efforts are also saved. Um, by support of hard command in the PLC program itself, um, it will also allow remote calibration of the devices. Um, and it, overall, it leads into significant saving on wiring equipment and um, commissioning efforts that are involved um, during commissioning and installation stage. Um, now, the plant operations is also significantly improve, improved with the support for hard command on the PLC. Uh, it allows easy remote updates to the device parameters. For example, setting up the uh, travel limit for the control wall damping constants or scale frictions on the transmitters. So all these functions can be done remotely through the PLC program itself without a need for doing this through, a asset, man through asset manager or a handheld terminal in the field. Okay. Um, moreover, the device diagnostics can be fetched directly into the PLC program and it can be used for things like interlocks or any other logic uh, that works in the PLC. So, so overall, it, uh, the capability to have hard function blocks or hard commands within the PLC program, it reduces the cost, uh, saves on the wiring, equipment, and operations-related um, efforts. I'm going to walk through a few examples here and use cases on how hard command support in the PLC program um, is, is making the engineering or testing or commissioning efforts easier. Uh, so this is one of the examples where uh, the uh, transmitter with device ID5 is connected to a PLC. Now, during commissioning, typically, let's say an uh, example of wellhead skid, uh, there are various instruments that get connected to a wellhead, but you want to make sure that you're connecting to the right instrument. Uh, you are setting up the ranges, uh, you're setting and calibrating the device appropriately. So device ID is the important information which needs to get into the PLC program and also on the asset manager by having the ability to read the device ID from the program and then setting up the associated parameters for the device, it significantly uh, speeds up the loop testing and it reduces the error during the startup as well. So in this particular case, um, that you see here, hard command zero is being used to read the uh, instrument device ID and to confirm that the correct instrument is being attached to the PLC. So uh, that's one of the examples the second use case I would like to walk through is about command 40. If you can use command 40 uh, from the uh, engineering environment, um, this particular case is on the gas kit. Uh, you have a requirement of doing a wall stroke test during the integration stage. So 
So wall stroke test can be conducted using the command 40, and it uh, reduces the risk when the system is shipped at the site for commissioning uh, by ability to do through the PLC. This particular function through PLC, you are also saving significantly on the time um, as, as you're doing it upfront and you're reducing the risk before system arrives at the site. Okay, so the last use case I would like to talk about is many times you will uh, have um, different flow conditions uh, at will head uh, or different sites and you would like to configure the device. Um, uh, for example, there are multiple transmitters and you would like to set them up for different um, values uh, and ranges. So you can do this uh, through command 35 where you can write the ranges to the instruments remotely from PLC itself. And um, this is an example of how command 35 is implemented um, through the control uh, through the PLC and uh, how it writes onto the field device. Okay, so with that, I would like to summarize um, the uh, today's session. So with embedded cybersecurity in PLC, it ensures improved plant safety, ensures regulatory compliance, and it reduces the cost and risk associated with the uh, regulatory compliance. The benefits associated with PLC and asset management integration are you, this enables healthy asset conditions in the plant, in the, which results in improved plant safety and availability, improves the productivity by allowing you to do a lot of tasks remotely. Uh, it also ensures hassle-free maintenance, uh, resulting in improved safety and cost. So all in all, I think um, these two factors are very crucial in selecting the PLC that is embedded cybersecurity and integration with asset management system uh, should be the selection factors on the modern day PLC with, uh, which are facing different challenges uh, and changes in the trend in the uh, market and in the industry. So with that, I would like to open uh, this forum for any questions. All right, very well, and just a reminder to all of our attendees how they can send in a question. Q&A located on the right-hand side of your screen. If you'd like to submit a question, type your question in the small text box at the bottom. When you're finished, just simply click the Send button. Please note, due to time constraints, our panel may not be able to respond to all the questions that have been submitted. So with that, uh, Swapnil, I'll turn things back over to you to uh, begin addressing the questions we have received. Okay, sure. So once again, I'm kind of uh, facing difficulty here, um, Mike. I believe if you click on the name of the person, you should be able to expand out the question and also the possible response that was sent privately. Okay. Over on the right hand side. Uh, what's happening is, yeah, the questions are getting hidden under uh, the other tab. So it would be good if you can help me to read the questions. Sure. So um, one question that we did receive. Um, it reads as follows. What agency is one ISA certify? Um, okay, make, so um, can, you, can you say that again? What, what agency is one ISA what certify? ISA? Okay, I have heard this for the first time. Uh, so we have our cybersecurity expert, Harshal, on the call. Um, Actually, have you heard of this one ISA? Uh, and actually, Swapnil, I believe that uh, Harshal may have had to drop off of the call at this point, um, so he is okay. not connected. But perhaps we can move on and, and address uh, that question um, offline. Okay, so well, the way probably I'm reading this question, uh, Mike, is uh, it is a question asking which agency uh, certifies ISA uh, secure. So if I'm interpreting it tightly, um, one of the examples that I mentioned in, during the presentation, Exida is an um, agency which certifies for ISA Secure. So let's go to uh, the next one. All right, great. The next one reads as follows. It is, is it required as per ISA specification standards to have the PLC certified as per IEC 62443? Uh, yes, I would say the answer is um, that the PLCs, not just PLCs, but also um, any other embedded devices in the control system. It may be DC controller or it can be RTU. Um, as per the standard, 
any device complying to these specifications are considered to be more reliable when it comes to handling the cyber security um, uh, cyber security threats now it is i would say the agency itself or the standard itself does not make it mandatory uh, it is made mandatory by uh, the plant philosophies plant processes or government regulations um, and i see that um, the answer from harshal has just come in yeah and um, yes yeah, so that that's also valid um, is i say i think it's 2443 is the only standard today uh, that defines the security requirements Ms. Swapna, are you able to see the questions now as well? Yes, I am able to see because uh, I'm scrolling at the bottom. There's a scroll bar. Oh, perfect. Okay. So I am not seeing any new... Uh, okay, uh, there's one new question that has come up. New IEC 61511 specified cyber security certification compliance. Uh, and... this is in response okay so this is basically a user uh, the audience response to uh, the earlier question i believe uh, so not not a question but more of a comment all right very well any additional questions that you're seeing that you'd like to address or are you ready to move on to closing comments yeah i'm not seeing any new questions uh, here mike Great. Any uh, concluding thoughts, Swapnil, from your location before we wrap things up today? Um, so, the concluding thought, I would uh, like to just reiterate um, the compliance to the IEC 62443 standard uh, is uh, absolutely critical for the cyber security of the PLC installations. It does add uh, to the safety and uh, to the plant uptime with, with the compliance to the standards. and also with the integration with the asset management system so i i would just like to reiterate the message here all right very well and thanks for a tremendous and terrific presentation today um on behalf of isa we would like to thank all of you for your participation in today's event If you missed any portion of this webinar or would like to rewatch the recorded version, we will be emailing all registrants a link to the recording along with additional links for supporting information. Now, a post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. If you would take a moment to complete this survey, it will help ISA plan future web events. This would conclude our program for today. Thanks everyone and have a great rest of your day.